Hello everyone, uh, my name is Elena Glinskaya. I am a program leader for education, health, social protection and labor here in China. And today I'll be giving a webinar uh, covering joint work done with the Development Research Center of the State Council of China on, Chi on urban China, on China's urbanization. And in particular, I will be covering um, issues related to inclusive urbanization. I understand um, that uh, now I can start. And I will proceed with uh, covering a little bit uh, the issues that many probably know, which are urbanization trends in China. Today, uh, as many know, uh, every second person in China uh, lives in urban area. And if we take 1.3 billion living in China right now, it's quite uh, a number uh, living in urban areas. Number of internal migrants reached 120 million in 2010 and now accounts for about 17% of the total population. This labor migration contributes to the structural transformation of the economy in integration of the labor market and played a very important role in reducing poverty and narrowing the gap between urban and rural areas. Again, I will probably talk about things that many of you already know. And uh, by 2030, China's urban population is projected to grow to 1 billion. So we're talking about 1 billion of urban uh, residents living in China. The majority, the bulk of this increase is going to be driven by the urban, by the rural to urban migration. Let me now talk about uh, one feature which is very different in China's urbanization. Maybe many, uh, many uh, countries urbanized and uh, urbanization in China is not particularly fast uh, by international standards. But what's very different, very distinct in China's urbanization is that uh, China has a system which is called Hukoi, a uh, household registration system. It defines people residence status. And in particular, it classifies the population into the rural and urban according to their place of birth rather than their place of residency. And it defines people access to public services based on this particular qualification. And in particular, um, uh, access to such services as employment, education for children, and also training for the adults, health, housing, and social protection program is defined by the particular hukou that uh, individual and his family holds. When stakeholders, researchers, policy makers, observers talk about uh, inequalities in China urbanization, they talk about two things. There are two sides of one coin in making China's urbanization equal. And these are two dualisms. One dualism is called new dualism, and it's among the urban population. And in particular, this reflects the features that I just talked about, the huko. Newcomers to the cities are often excluded from access to urban services. But there is also the old dualism of urban and rural disparities, because there are large gaps in quantity and quality of public services, that observed across provinces and particularly between the urban and rural areas. So when we talk about inequalities in China urbanization or when we talk about Chinese urbanization becoming uh, inclusive, we talk about solving these two intertwined challenges. And they are intertwined because if people move to cities for better public services instead of moving to product for productive jobs, we know what happened, congestion and, uh, congestion and unemployment. And conversely, if people don't move when there are jobs for them, then efficiency will, um, uh, will suffer and there would be, um, as I said, there will be efficiency losses. So what, will, what kind of um, policies can integrate um, this uh, to the, the solution uh, for these two dualisms? In, uh, in this joint work with the DRC, we talk about labor market, which can assure full integration and uh, institutions of the labor market can be essential to overcome both old and new dualisms. Um, the 
solution, the, the, the approaches to China's urbanization and in particular to making it inclusive is not happening in vacuum. It coming, it's happening in the uh, social and economic context. And this social and economic context is quite rich. On this slide, you have one picture. You can see one picture. What we are trying to depict here is the aspirations of the migrants. The migrants who are coming to the cities today are very different from migrants who came 30, 20 years ago. People are coming for good jobs. People believe that there are very uh, good uh, things that are waiting for them uh, in, uh, in urban areas. At the same time, what we see in the economy, we see signs of stalling labor productivity growth, especially in the second half of the 2000s. We also see that these migrants who are coming with very high aspirations, uh, all, only uh, almost 70% of them did not receive any training. We also see that very few graduates are uh, entering the uh, labor market in China today. Only 10% of uh, the current China's labor force has college education. And if you compare it with such countries like Korea, Japan, and the U.S., there is quite, you know, there is uh, quite a difference. We also see that um, in the labor market, labor disputes are um, increasing uh, at a very high speed. We also see that um, labor uh, is reaching the so-called lowest turning, turning point, meaning that the uh, rural labor surplus is almost exhausted. And we also see that the population and the workers that are still in the labor market, they are aging uh, very rapidly. So this social and economic context um, defines the, uh, the background in which the government is promoting inclusive urbanization policies. Um, it's important to define the vision. It's very important to uh, articulate what does it mean to uh, have uh, uh, urbanization inclusive. And in this joint work, we spent quite a bit of time articulating the vision of inclusive urbanization, which is presented on this slide. It's about free movement of people to seek and maximize economic opportunities, and it's about the equitable access to basic social services and social protection. We then talk about the policy reforms that are necessary to achieve this vision. And the policy reforms that I'm going to talk about and that we believe uh, would be necessary to take forward for inclusive urbanization are uh, household registration system, HUCO reform, public finance reform, reforms in the service delivery systems, and in particular, I'm going to talk about education, health care, pension, and social assistance, and labor market institutions. Let me now talk about equalization agenda in more detail. So we're coming from the bird eye view to uh, zeroing in on particular uh, specific um, uh, sections and reforms. When we talk about equalization agenda, as I already said, we talk about the uh, reforms in urban and rural areas. In urban areas, we are talking about the prevailing urban so standard of social services for all residents of urban, area, of urban areas. For that, the reforms need to take place in residence-based eligibilities, basically rules for granting residents and sequencing of these access rights, modality of provision of social services, and short-term fiscal subsidies for the city. I'm going to talk, ab talk about all these uh, reforms in turn. For rural-urban integration, the equalization needs to take place through access to minimum package across provinces and urban and rural areas. For that uh, type of equalization to go forward, the following reforms are needed. The guaranteed minimum package of services and social insurances guaranteed by the central government, incentives for local government to top up this for all residents, sectorial reforms to increase efficiency and improve equity, accountability reforms, which basically would work to contain costs, and medium-term fiscal subsidies and reforms. Okay. Let me uh, now uh, talk a little bit more about the reforms in urban areas. 
and in particular about the reform which will take us from the origin-based system of eligibility, HUCO, to a modern resident system. Um, China has been reforming for quite some time, so there are pilots, and we, uh, in this joint work with the DRC, document and discuss uh, some of these pilots. The, the most interesting one took place in Shenzhen, in Chongqing, Shanghai, and Guangdong. Um, we also um, talk about and we also look at the experiences of uh, granting eligibility rules for social services in such uh, countries as the U.S. and Japan, and we also look at the rules which prevail in the EU, in the European Union. When we look at these uh, examples and we look at these uh, uh, pilots in totality, we see four major um, patterns. We see large cities bias, especially in China. So what we see is that it's much easier to receive uh, huko, it's much easier to uh, have access to social services in the small cities. But of course, the quality and quantity of social services in small cities are, are much fewer. So there is less interest from the migrants to be in these cities. While in the large cities, in such cities as especially mega cities as Shanghai and Beijing, the um, the rules for receiving hukou, the rules for having access to the social services, are much more stringent. What we also see through these pilots is selection of migrants with desired characteristics. In fact, these large cities act like foreign countries which look at the uh, qualifications of uh, incoming migrants and see who is granted a residency, who is granted who or not. If you have high uh, education, you have get more points and, and so on and so forth. Even such, uh, such qualities as you know, participation in um, social events, as blood donations, things like this are also uh, included in uh, consideration for uh, granting hook or not in, in some of the cities. But on the other hand, uh, we also see um, strong um, um, views from the um, current residents and from the current uh, authorities uh, in the cities uh, worrying that cities become welfare magnets, that people are not going to come for productive jobs. Instead, they are going to come for the better uh, social services. What we also observe is social tensions and competition for urban services in, uh, in these cities which provide um, access to good quality social services. So all these tensions, all these different views need to be managed. Um, so when we talk about the, uh, about the reforms in urban areas, and in particular when we talk about hukou reforms, we put forward several uh, ideas. First, we talk about the central government defining the principles and the national framework, which will provide guidelines for the local governments. Then we talk about the local governments defining the qualifying periods for accessing privileges. And then, most importantly, we talk about the convergence of these approaches over time across uh, space. So, in fact, we're talking about uh, allowing for quite a bit of variability at the initial stages in terms of granting uh, access, in terms of um, giving out those hookers. But what's very important is to define the time span after which these um, uh, approaches and these rules need to converge in China, in urban China overall. And then we talk about the um, uh, IT platform, which would need to be developed to support this uh, major transformation in uh, such a large uh, country as China is. We also talk about provision, uh, modality of provision solver social services. We are talking sort of very large numbers here. So in education, uh, the current policy is uh, residence-based already, but incorporating all the newcomers in the government schools across China, probably impossible at the initial stages. So we talk about incorporating migrant children in private schools at some point, but with public subsidy to cover the fees in the school charge. We also talk about the modality of provision in healthcare, and here we talk about incorporating migrants in the existing schemes, which will mean that they will switch from the rural schemes that already have access to, to urban schemes. And we look uh, at the possible modalities of, uh, of this switch. 
We also talk about uh, equalization in the area of old age security and pension. And what we propose is that uh, migrant workers should be encouraged to uh, uh, join the schemes which at this point are um, eligible, uh, available to, um, to the urban uh, workers. And we go through possible modalities of, uh, of this uh, switch. We also talk about uh, social assistance. Um, eligibility for social assistance and migrant workers and uh, their families right now are not eligible for DBAO payments, for example. Here we talk that eligibility for this kind of uh, support, for this kind of uh, assistance perhaps does not have to come first. The um, services which are uh, more important in uh, accumulating uh, human capital should come first. We also talk about housing, and we basically talk not about housing ownership. We're talking about uh, demand-side subsidies, which would allow um, migrants to uh, live in the cities uh, where they work. Then we go and we estimate. We actually uh, do some estimates of how much it would cost to incorporate all the current migrants under this modality of provision into the cities where they are the way they are right now. And the estimate is about 2% uh, of GDP per annum. Of course, this is something which China can afford. But we also argue that in the short term, uh, a higher level of governments should consider subsidizing cities for this increased cost of uh, service provision for migrants. Excuse me. Let me just get a little bit of water. Having tackled issues in urban areas, let me now talk about rural-urban integration, and particularly about, um, first of all, the approaches to equalization. What does it mean to equalize um, across provinces and urban areas? And the way we interpret this in this joint work is uh, equalization will proceed uh, around the minimum package of social services and social insurances guaranteed by the central government. And in particular, this minimum package could include an expanded cycle of quality general education that would be accessible for all. Pre primary education would be available and affordable. And secondary uh, education and basic education should be fee free. Pension and health insurance systems should have full coverage and provide uniform and deep financial uh, protection, integrating rural, urban, and uh, migrant residents. And labor mobility should be based on social security system in which entitlements are portable across provinces and the high risk pooling reduces spatial disparities. I already mentioned the safety nets which should be available for the poorest and most vulnerable. Excuse me. The other, uh, the next part of this urban rural equalization is sectorial reforms. And sectorial reforms are very important uh, in a sense that um, the cost of rural urban equalization is of course much larger than the cost of uh, reforms in the urban areas alone. So these sectorial reforms together with the cross-cutting governance reforms is something which is considered necessary to be able to afford um, this, to make uh, this transition much more affordable. So in education, we talk about reforms um, uh, experimenting with the demand side financing to st stimulate competition and choice. We talk about uh, encouraging private provision, particularly in the non-compulsory stages of education. We also talk about the various reform to align teachers' incentives and improve the quality of instruction. In healthcare, we talk about reforms which will prepare the urban delivery system for increased demand for health services. And where we put a lot of emphasis on the improvement of the primary health care services and coordination among hospitals, providers, and public health professionals. We talk about people-centered health care system. What's very important, especially in health care where the costs are rising very quickly, is to arrest this escalating cost by introducing provider payment system, managerial control measure, and institutional separation revenues from expenditures. Integrating portability of health insurance 
was also very important. In other words, people should be able to get treated in the places where the uh, best treatment exists, not necessarily in the places where, um, where they are. And fostering the healthy urban environment is, of course, a very important uh, area of uh, not only healthcare reform, but the broader overall reform package. Um, we also talk about the sectorial reform uh, in pension area. And here the key is upgrading pooling area, pooling level. It's uh, the a reform which is necessary for both uh, efficiency and uh, inclusion in the area of old age protection. We talk about achieving financial sustainability and improving participation incentives through parametric changes. For example, the, again, I mean, many are familiar with the fact that uh, the minimum retirement age is uh, quite low in China, and increasing it to 65 will help a lot in uh, ensuring sustainability of the uh, pension system. We talk about partial funding strategy to address the future cash flow funding requirements. And we talk about the ways to, um, to establish um, these um, financial buffers and reserves uh, on the provincial basis. We talk about a so-called um, um, funding strategy about financing legacy costs from general revenues from, rather than from pension uh, contribution, from current pension contribution. And we moving, we're talking about the moving to integrated design for the pension system. With integration design, the integrated design would be a three pillar, pillar, uh, pillar system basic pillar, contributory pillar, and supplementary pillar. In the area of social assistance, we talk about reforming the backbone system, which is DBAO, through consolidation, standardization, and uh, harmonization with the, the existing anti poverty interventions. Uh, um, that basically sort of look uh, after the uh, development, after the area development uh, programs. So gra gradually moving towards a more systematic approach in determining eligibility thresholds is also an important uh, uh, sectorial reform in the area of uh, social assistance. Um, when we discuss cutting accountability reforms, we look at three channels of accountability, government system, citizens based, and choice market based. On the government system, China is doing pretty well. So it's actually uh, an area where we uh, don't have uh, much to say. We just talk about um, strengthening the existing system. But in the area of citizens based channels, we are talking about harnessing information to generate as citizens' oversight and feedback on service delivery performance. Again, there are you know, quite a few uh, pilots which already exist in China, and we discuss uh, how this could be um, leveraged and how, how this could be used uh, more, uh, more widely. We also talk about choice and market-based channels, and this is about bringing demand-side financing and greater public purchasing of social services within the appropriate framework of cost. Um, in the area of fiscal system reform, we talk about uh, reforms both on the uh, revenue and expenditure side and important incentives from the central national government to the local governments to offer top-ups, but for all, not only for those who, uh, who have the uh, original hukou in, uh, in the place of their current residency and the place of their current work. Labor market institutions and skill acquisition reforms are also key in uh, making China's organization uh, inclusive. In the area of uh, labor market institutions, we talk about wage setting. We talk about labor taxation, which is very uh, high, and there are potential for reductions in pension and employment, and especially housing contribution. But they need to be accompanied by the reforms in the overall tax mix and financing especially in the pensions area. We suggest to monitor the implementation of the labor contract law, which is quite generous in terms of handling uh, open-ended contracts and uh, dismissals. And we also talk about strengthening dispute resolution system to, to handle interest disputes, because right now the system is much more geared towards uh, uh, handling the contractual, the, the, the rights dispute. In the area of skill acquisition, which is um, also you know, an area which um, 
as I mentioned, is quite critical for China because of the still low level of human capital. In the area of TVEC, technical vocational education and uh, non-formal training, the reforms are about using more efficient use of training resources, broadening ongoing experiments with demand-side financing again, uh, building institutions of accreditation for skills and increasing portability and relevance of employees uh, and uh, skill certification. The area, the area, the, the, the reforms in higher education are more towards strengthening links between higher education system and the industry, increasing resources, and greater autonomy. We also talk about perhaps revision of the current provincial, provincial quota, which exists uh, towards more populous provinces. Um, in terms of uh, bringing uh, people from bringing students from provinces in uh, into the high uh, high uh, learning institutions in uh, in the major uh, in the major cities. That's um, pretty much everything uh, from my side in terms of the uh, presentation. Um, there is question and answer session, and I would be uh, very happy to try to answer your questions. We prepared some uh, polling questions right now, and I see this on the um, on the screen right now. I understand that uh, um, those who participated in the webinar would be given a chance to answer some of the questions. Um, the first is about uh, can people move from a countryside to a city, or from one city to another. And um, I can see the answers on the screen right now. I think we are still telling the answers. Um, the choices um, that you can choose from are uh, yes, no, yes, but they will have to not, but they will not be able to automatically access services in unication. And we have about 10% of participants choosing this answer. And then uh, we have the overwhelming majority, 90%, are uh, choosing the answer that yes, they will be able to move but they and their families will not be able to automatically access uh, uh, social services, which is the right answer. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the um, that's pretty much the situation, especially in the big cities uh, in China right now. And as I described, uh, sort of we are looking at uh, practical ways of uh, helping the government to move from the existing system. A system which would be much more equitable towards uh, towards the citizens in China. Um, I can see the second question on the screen, <clears throat> and the question is: um, For urbanization in China to be inclusive, uh, where should the government um, focus its reforms? We have quorum. We have hundred percent of our participants uh, answering that the. Uh, um, the reforms and the efforts should be uh, focused both in urban and rural areas, which is the intended answer because, uh, as I described, um, these are intertwined um, reforms and these are intertwined areas. You cannot make urbanization inclusive without addressing the plight, the issues in the, in the rural areas. Um, I think there should be a third question. And the question is about the level of the government, national or subnational, that should assume responsibility for financing the minimum package of social services. And as we talked, the minimum um, package um, is um, uh, something which should be the the floor, which should be the the foundation for rural-rural uh, integration, and not only rural-rural integration, but integration in the space of, uh, of um, you know, entire nation. What we see by the way of answers is that um, about 85% of our participants said that a national uh, government should assume responsibility for financing the minimum package of social services, but about 15% answered that um, subnational 
excuse me, subnational governments should be financing um, the minimum package both in urban and rural areas. I would be curious to know why that there is a view that it's the role of the subnational government. Because the intended answer is that it's national in both, because externality of the international of, of the of the integration, of course, accrue to the uh, to the nation and uh, as a whole. <coughs> let me let me close the question and answer session right now. And I think what we can do is to um, to open the um, open the chat room for for the questions, and I will try to answer as many questions as possible given the time that we have. Um, somebody is asking what DBAO means. DBAO it's a social assistance program. It's a minimum guarantee program in China, which was introduced in the um, sort of in the mid 80s. But now, basically, the main social assistance uh, program in uh, in China it exists both in urban and rural areas. But the issues are that it's very fragmented, that the eligibility is very, um, the eligibility rules, the thresholds for eligibility and the payments are very different across urban rural areas and across cities, which creates a lot of um, sort of resentment and inequalities. Um, um, let, me, uh, let me look for other, um, other questions. Um, Um, somebody is um, wishing us good evening. Somebody is wishing us good morning. Very nice. Good morning and good evening. Um, we have um, we have lots of um, um, okay. We have a question from Moad Al Rubadi, who is asking uh, whether it's easier to work with local governments or with national governments. I assume it's the question about China. Um, I find uh, working in China with the government extremely easy, um, and that uh, refers to both uh, both uh, national and local governments. Um, what I find easy, and I'll explain, is that uh, the um, the commitment, the drive to results, is astonishing for me. And um, it's very easy to work with uh, people who are very driven, who people who want to uh, uh, basically, um, you know, have results and as soon as possible. So once you're in agreement on what constitutes a result, once you're in agreement what needs to be done, the implementation is um, very, very smooth usually. But that, that, that's what I mean by um, sort of easy very easy way of working in China, both at the national and subnational level. Then Ataula Khan is asking whether the system is exclusively public funded. Um, mm. I assume that the question is about the um, system of social services. Um, what's publicly funded is what, um, what is guaranteed, what the government choose to guarantee. And in education, for example, it's a system of basic education. The government provides public funding for basic education, right? Of course, quality is different across different um, provinces, cities, urban and rural areas. We talked about it. But this is a guaranteed uh, uh, social uh, service. In health, um, there is, um, there are, right now, there are several insurance schemes, but the coverage is very... Uh, very wide. About 95% of the population right now is covered by, by health insurance. There's, as I said, there are different schemes and the depth uh, of coverage is quite different across them. But uh, this is something which is uh, covered both through contributions and through the government uh, public subsidies. In pension system, it's also not fully publicly funded. It's funded through uh, subsidies. Uh, and through, uh, through the contributions. Um, the DBAO system, the social assistance system, is publicly funded. So I guess um, it, it depends on a particular service, whether it's publicly funded or there are contributions from the users required. Uh, let, me, uh, let me take another question. 
uh, the question is from Aveli, uh, and um, it uh, goes like this. Um, uh, all over the world, especially developing and emerging economies, government policies tend to, for, to favor urban dwellers. What's the Chinese government policy to tackle urban bias? Um, that's, um, that's probably uh, true. Um, um, and um, um, the government, uh, the, um, the, main, uh, the main policy that the government um, has uh, in place and arguably the main policy that uh, the government needs to implement is to free hookah, right? Because um, uh, a lot of inequalities could be uh, solved through allowing people this free mobility. But at the same time, uh, in the rural areas, the provision of the minimum uh, level of services is necessary, right? So it, it, it's, um, it's uh, hard to talk about urban bias in social services, uh, for example, in the medium run, because some of these differences could be justified, right? People have different preferences and uh, people are willing to co-finance and there are uh, sort of in efficiencies in uh, urban agglomeration and in provision services to the uh, compactly uh, living populations. There are lots of things, you know, there are lots of arguments one may, might make of why it's easier to provide services in urban areas. But what's very important is not leaving behind the rural areas not abandoning it. What's very important is to provide the minimum level of services and then allow people to move when they are ready to move for productive jobs. Um, let me take another question, which is from Felicity Proctor, and um, it's about Central Committee of the Communist Party of China and the State Councils. Uh, are saying in one of their documents that one of five areas stated as pushing forward the development of a new countryside through an integrated urban rural development. How does your work uh, um, fit uh, with this policy uh, statement? I'm actually I'm I'm not <laughs> I'm not familiar with this particular one, but but again I mean the the, the thrust of the um, I'm, I'm not familiar with this document, but the thrust of the policies is about reforms, f suitable reforms in urban area areas, and about reforms which can bring uh, integration between urban and rural uh, areas. And this integration is not only about roads. Roads are extremely important. It's not only about infrastructure. Infrastructure is extremely important. It's also about integrated labor market. It's also about integration in service provision. It's also integration in such services as pension uh, security, social security, things that allow people to be mobile across uh, urban and rural areas. Um, let me see if there are other questions. Um, um, I, uh, yes, I see, um, I see a question from RJ Sharma uh, regarding social security pension is necessary for all individuals. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's why what we're talking about is an um, integrated system, right? So, uh, integrated system because uh, uh, that uh, kind of design will allow to have a social pension for those who cannot contribute a lot during their working life for whatever reasons. You have a pension which is contributory, which allows uh, you to save uh, Money and then you um, and then you you basically um, have um, the design. You have the policy design that is uh, suitable for all kinds of um, uh, different kinds of circumstances, working uh, careers, living arrangements, and so on and so forth. But uh, what's important to uh, say also that China has been extremely um, uh, successful in expanding. Uh, uh, pension coverage. Um, right now, it's about 
sort of 85% of uh, workers are covered by one of the three main existing pension schemes. The problem is that the schemes are not that portable. The problem is, is that within these schemes, they do not encourage mobility because the pooling is at a you know, significantly lower level than the efficiency would require. So that's, um, that's uh, the, the area, the policy area where the government is, uh, is planning to focus. Um, we have a new question from, um, uh, from Rema Ramachandran, and it's about the new and old dualism in rural and urban areas. Um, uh, if I if I can explain this Chinese uh, case a little bit um, a little bit more in, in more details, uh, sure sure. It's um, to, to, there are there are different approaches to defining inequalities, right? And inequality, um, um, we have lots of definitions in terms of measuring inequality of income. We can measure inequality of assets, opportunity, and so on and so forth. But each particular country has its own uh, flavor of what the main uh, aspects of inequality, what does inequality mean for this particular country. So when we talk about inequality in China, and particularly when we talk about inequality in uh, China's uh, process of urbanization, what strikes a chord with um, researchers, policymakers, observers, it's about the inequalities within air, urban areas, have and have not, and the have nots are those who are with wrong hookers. So within urban areas, we uh, observe inequalities between the, you know, you can call them bona fide urban dwellers and the newcomers, people who are migrants, people who have rural hookers while working and paying taxes in urban areas. So these are urban inequalities, urban dualism. But then we have the long-lasting inequality between urban and rural areas. Somebody already mentioned that um, urban incomes and rural incomes still quite far from each other. So this is the second world dualism, the old dualism. These are notations, but, but, but these notations capture the uh, sentiment about uh, urbanization in China pretty well in, in, in view of people who, who, uh, who worked on the report. Uh, we have another question from Ajay Sharma. Um, about acceptance of host population is the main drawback. And I, I have to agree with that. Um, when we were working on uh, this particular area of the report, we sort of looked at uh, various literature. And there is quite a few um, you know, research articles and articles, papers in mass media and so on and so forth, which talk about um, you know, quite, or quite a competition for urban services between the uh, urban dwellers and between the migrants in Shanghai when the government said that they're going to open access to urban schools and especially to the exams, secondary school exams for migrants, the um, population took to the streets. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult process. It's a social transformation which needs to be managed. And the best way to manage that is not uh, create a zero-sum game situation, but to sort of have uh, policies, to institute policies, which will um, sort of increase the pie, so to speak, for both those who lived in urban areas for a long time and those who came there recently but came for work. Um, let me see if there are more questions. Uh, um, I think something something is coming. Um, um, let me let me see if there are if there are more questions. I don't see anything right now on, on the on the chat in the chat screen. Um, um, there is um, there is another question from Arema is about uh, China facing labor market integration and labor market institutions. Um, um, labor market integration is um, quite deep in China, but of course there is um, there is uh, more uh, that. 
um, that can be done, especially in the in this new environment where you know there's quite a bit of industrial relocation is happening. China is shedding uh, low-skilled jobs, and China is trying to create high-skilled jobs. Right? That, that 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 requires you know quite a seamless integration. You know because people need to move uh, industries, people need to move locations, and so on and so forth. So the, the the demands on the labor market be be very responsive are quite quite high, and um, in terms of uh, China labor market institutions, these are quite elaborate, and the protection of workers in the labor market by this institution, those who are in the formal sector, is quite quite high. So when we talk about um, China labor market institutions, we always talk about sort of uh, reaching uh, reaching a, a point where um, efficiency and protection uh, don't come into the um, into the conflicts. So finding a point where uh, uh, labor market institutions do not hinder um, creation of the good formal jobs. And if you look at the uh, social taxes, at the taxes which uh, go for various kinds of social uh, social security um, uh, purposes, they're quite high in China. They're actually at the at OECD level. So again, I mean, this is this is an area where a balance is needed. And in the report, we we discuss, um, you know, to some degree what uh, what kind of balance would. Uh, would make sense uh, for China at this particular point. Um, I see uh, other questions. Um, um, there is um, uh, there is a question from Felicity Proctor asking what our World Bank is planning next in taking forward this work. Um, in, in, in some ways, we are very happy with the way this um, research has been uh, used already. As I said, it's been it's a joint work between the World Bank and also Development Research Center of the State Council. So, you know, this this policies, many of the recommendations are already uh, influenced uh, the um, the the policy documents that uh, the China uh, the Chinese authorities are putting forward right now. Um, there is no immediate plans for uh, doing anything with this particular uh, volume, urban China. Uh, let me just say in, in a couple of words that the next um, flagship publication that uh, the World Bank is working on in China is on reforming China's health uh, system. And that is going to be ready sometime in the fall, late fall. That's uh, that we are looking in deeper issues of uh, reforming, uh, forming the health uh, service delivery system. Um, there is another qu question from Guy Tracing, uh, who is asking, will the relative differences in relaxation of hukou across cities of different size, sizes likely to increase inequality be between migrants and non-migrants? Um, I don't. I, I I wouldn't say. I, I wouldn't immediately say that um, that uh, what would uh, that this particular policy will increase inequality between migrants and non-migrants because um, at any rate, um, urban services are better than rural services. And if you go to the small and medium-sized towns, in terms of um, um, access to the social services and also in terms of uh, uh, wages, there is very little differences between uh, migrants and non-migrants. We have the stark differences, where we observe stark differences in the big cities and that's where the problems lie. Uh, and um, that's where sort of policies would need to take place at some point. Again, from the practical point of view, it's understandable that you know you cannot just open up access completely uh, tomorrow, that it needs to be a managed process, but the process needs to be taken place. And what we feel is a very important policy here is to commit to a timeline, right? So commitment to a timeline and then executing the steps within time, this timeline is the policy which would allow to open up uh, 
uh, hookah um, in 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 larger cities, while in the small and medium cities, it's 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 practically sort of being being open right now. I mean, of, of course, there are there, there are still you know wrinkles and so on and so forth. But in terms of the government policies, uh, receiving hookah in the small and medium town is um, not problematic at this point. Um, there is a question about. Um, non-migrants in larger cities given um, um, non-migrants in larger cities given that they have more control on who to exclude um, the, I, the, it's hard the, the policy reform, the hookah reform in large cities is very hard but as, as I just speak I mean as, as I just uh, mentioned perhaps one policy that could be implemented at this point is committing to a timeline um, um, I also have a um, question from Ajay Sharma about the low spending on higher education uh, being the main problem of developing countries. Um, public spending in China, uh, public spending on education in China are low, but uh, private, uh, private spendings uh, exist and they are not... Uh, um, not uh, very low. I, I, I don't disagree. Um, in higher education spending is uh, very important, especially when they are um, done through uh, uh, in also encouraging different uh, strata, different populations through stipends and, uh, and similar, similar instruments. Um, um, let me... Um, let me talk uh, about the um, points, about the final points uh, for this seminar. Um, as I said, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to have you as my audience. I hope that uh, this uh, presentation was useful. And um, I understand that the, we can keep the, um, the line open for questions uh, that I would try to answer after the seminar is over. So if you, can, uh, if you would like to submit any questions off a line, I will try to collect them and I'll try to answer. Thank you.